who are basically working class could get Medicaid. It's expanded Medicaid. And what they originally did when they passed the Affordable Care Act is the government, the federal government, vowed to fund uh, the, you know, to basically finance it 100% so that states basically didn't have to put any money in. Red states, the states that used to be slave states, said we don't want it. Even though it would save our rural hospitals, even though it would save people's lives, we don't want that dirty Obama money. No. Florida said no. Texas said no. Louisiana said no. Kentucky said no. Well, actually, Kentucky said yes. Why did Kentucky say yes? Because they had a man named Governor Bashir, who was a, a, a Democrat. And he said, I'll take the money, but I'm going to call it Connect. Because people in my state are conservative and they don't like Obama. So they will take something called Connect as long as they don't think it's Obamacare. So they took it. And people for the first time, rural people who had never gotten to have a, go to a doctor, were going to the doctor. They're like, this is amazing. And then a Republican ran against Mr. Bashir and said, I will run on repealing Obamacare. And the conservative voters in that state said, yeah, let's get rid of Obamacare. Put that guy in. Put him in. And he tried to get rid of Obamacare. And then people went, you can't get rid of Connect. That's my, that's my health care. He said, I said I was going to get rid of Obamacare. What are you talking about? I'm doing what you, what you hired me to do. And you know what they did? They elected Mr. Bashir's son. They said, get out, Republican. Go away. Get out. And they put the son in. And so the Bashir that's in there is the son. The daddy's the one who came to Obamacare. And when the Republican tried to get rid of it, they went, what? No. <laughs> no, stop. <laughs> so people, as you said, they respond to the actual things. You know this state right here has Obamacare? You know how they got it? John Bell. A Democrat. <laughs> John Bell. This state, Louisiana, elected a Democrat. He came in there, and this state was the number one incarcerator of Americans. Number one. They have a thing called Angola Prison here, which is a plantation where the 13th Amendment says you can put in people to slave labor. And they like incarcerating, especially black people in the state of Louisiana. They love it. But John Bell Edwards comes in, and he reduced the incarceration rate. He actually, they're like 46 or 40-something. They're no longer like last. They're no longer the number one incarcerator. And he passed through Obamacare which they call it probably something else here, but it's health care. And you know what people did in this last election? Elected Joe. They replaced him with the former uh, attorney general who is threatening that he will literally to punish New Orleans if the, the, the law enforcement here don't arrest and prosecute people who try to get abortions. He wants to put people in jail for getting abortions or trying to get abortions. Do you know what color the people are going to be who get arrested for trying to get an abortion? I'll let you guess. They look like they at the Essence Festival. <laughs> you don't vote because you like love John Bell Edwards or, or Andy Bashir or the Bashirs or even know who they are. You vote for yourself. It's self-preservation. None of them are going to move in your house. Biden ain't going to live with you. <laughs> no. And the, the reality is we live in a region of the country where 57% of black people live. Yes. 57% of black women live in states where they have no access to reproductive care at all. 57%. Project 2025 will make certain that we are denied not only reproductive care, we will be denied contraception, we will be denied IVF, and we will have no ability to escape to a place to get it because we can't afford anything because all of the jobs that we have, all of the protections we have will be gone. And so as Joy pointed out, the challenge of this election, everyone says it's the most important election. This is an existential election. It is a question of whether we continue to be true full citizens of this country as uneven as that has been in our history or whether we are legally relegated to a position of absolute powerlessness they've when there you've heard this when somebody tells you who they are believe them my angela told us this read project 2025 you don't have to read the whole thing just read a summary go to democracy forward and read the summary when they come after head start who are they coming after when they come after health care, who are they coming after? When they come after diversity in medical education, who are they coming after? We don't have a surplus of black and brown doctors in this country. But
but we do have a surplus of black and brown folks who don't have access to health care in this country. Everything that is at stake can be preserved if we get what we need. And what we need is a leader who believes in us. And this is not a partisan space, but I am hyper partisan in this. I have successfully worked with both parties. But what I will tell you is there is one party that actually sees me and has said that we will do things to help me. Voting is a selfish act. We like to talk about it in terms of community. Voting is selfish. People don't care about your politics. They care about their lives. Our job in the next four months is to connect the dots because not everyone understands that the pain they feel in their lives not only happens in the governor's mansion here in Louisiana, it happens in Washington, D.C. But our ability to change the narrative and to preserve our opportunity for more happens in November of 2024. If we cede that power, if we give away that opportunity, if we grant them the imprimatur to tell us that we don't matter, that we do not deserve more, they will take us up on it because they can count just like we can. They can see demographic maps. Atlanta's not getting smaller. Things aren't getting easier. Things are getting more complex. The racial diversity of this country is getting more complex. And that diversity demands that more of us be included. And this is the last thing I'll say. We often treat resources like they're finite. What DEI has proven is that when more of us get to participate, there's more of us that have things, but there's more stuff to go around. DEI increases the bottom line. It increases the money made. It increases the jobs created. It increases the opportunities multiplied. If we had, if we closed the racial wealth gap in this country, we would have created more than a trillion dollars in new revenue. That's money that pays for a lot of things that we need. But we've got to believe that we're entitled to it because when you believe you're entitled to something, you will fight for it. You will defend it. You will protect it and you will vote for it. And that's the mission that we have to have in the next four months. So I 